Next up, before joining insurance, our next speaker built and exited a national multi-million dollar advertising company that achieved over $62 million in annual revenue. He's the president and CEO of Advanced Team Partners, national IMO in life insurance space, and the founder of Life Insurance Academy. He's also co-host of the number one top-ranked Life Insurance Academy podcast, reaching agents all around the world with nearly 25, probably 30,000 downloads a month now, because I, I think this bio is old. And the founder of Power Producers in Paradise, an annual high-level business leadership summit in a tropical destination. His mission is to, in life, is to impact and the lives of others and to see them win at another level. His huge heart for people all the way from Louisville, Kentucky, one of my favorite people in the entire world. Please help me welcome to the 8% virtual stage. Let's keep the energy moving. Mr. Roger Short. What you know about rolling down in the deep when you Let's go mental freeze when these people talk too much, put it in slow motion. Yeah, I feel like an astronaut in the check, ocean. Check. What you know about rolling down in the deep when you Are we good? Are we live? Great. I get to follow the dance party. I'm not gonna give you any dance moves right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. If we could just advance that slide, that'd be great. Um I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to, first of all, say thank you to Cody Askins and the 8% uh, Nation uh, event group, the, the whole team here for putting on this event. Uh, Cody is fantastic, man. How many people have been joining us so far? If you've been enjoying this event so far and you love the energy and the content, I want you to type yes in the chat and give me some praise hands. Give me some praise hands in the chat. Yeah, let's see those and type yes in there. Great to see you guys. Thank you guys for being here with us today. We love this. This is a really cool environment. I love the fact that you're here with us today. I want to say hi to all of you guys. Derek Maben, I see you, man. I see you. I see you guys. Thank you for being here. There was an old movie um, by the name of City Slickers, a Billy Crystal movie. I don't know, I'm dating myself, but it's the story that matters. Billy Crystal is, a, is having a midlife crisis. He goes out west to, to drive cattle from New Mexico to Colorado. And uh, he's trying to find himself. His wife no longer wants, uh, wants him at home. Uh, he's depressed. He doesn't know his purpose in life. And he's spending time just out in the wilderness trying to find himself and clear his head. And the lead cowboy that's driving this herd of cattle from New Mexico to Colorado, his name's Curly. He's a grizzly old guy by the name of Jack Palance. Uh, if you remember him, Jack had this grovelly voice, and he spoke like this in all of his movies. And he had a little cigarette hanging off the bottom of his lip with his cowboy hat and his kerchief around his neck, and he had these gnarled leather gloves, and he was just riding on that, riding on that horse. And, and Mitch, played by, uh, who was played by Billy Crystal, uh, was talking to, uh, to Curly. And he said, Curly, seems like you got everything together in life, man. Like, I don't understand. What is it about you? He said, well... There's nothing like taking a herd of cattle in, you know, and bringing them across the river and bringing them in. There's just nothing like it. And he was just so calm and collective, and he was so sure of himself. And Curly said to him, what, what, uh, uh, Mitch said to him, Curly, what is your secret? What is your secret to this, to finding happiness in life? And Curly just raises up the gnarled glove, and he just raises it, and he just points it in the air. And, and, Curly, and Mitch is like, what? What is that? You? You're, you're pointing up. What is that? And he said, one thing, one thing. He said, if you get good at one thing, you know what your one thing is, everything else will work out. And he just left it there. And, and Mitch was like, I'm learning life lessons from a cowboy named Curly out, out on this, out on this uh, ranch, you know. And I would say to you, in life, if we had to narrow down everything we do and look at all the things that we can learn, all the skills that we could implement, and education that we could get, what would be one of the most valuable things that we could ever learn and implement in our life? What would that one thing be for you? I want you to type in there, one thing, question mark, in the chat. What is the one thing that would be for you that you could learn that would change everything for your life and the life of everybody around you? What do you think that would be? There was a book written by David Kale a few years ago and uh, that book was called Question Your Way to Sales Success. Question Your Way to Sales Success. And in that book, he talked about gaining the competitive edge and making every answer count. I will say to you that I believe if we get good 
at asking good questions in life, it will change everything for you. Because asking good questions opens up all kinds of doors. And so today I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to give a high-level overview of the opportunity in the business. I think you've gotten so much of that already some, from some tremendous speakers. I'm honored to be in this room with them. But we're going to take it down and we're going to give you some fundamental 101. Would that be okay if I gave you some fundamental sales 101? Would you guys like to learn some of that? If, if you're up for that with me, say yes. Put yes in the chat. Great. So... If, if you had to boil down everything to, uh, to learning this skill of asking good questions, what can that do for your life? Think about how it would improve your relationships at home. What's the other side of asking a good question? When you ask a good question, there's another component of that that needs to be implemented. And what is that? It's listening. Listening. And when we begin to listen and ask, as we ask good questions, we start to identify what people really have on their heart, what's really going on in their life. It would make our relationships better at home. It would make our engagements with our kids better. It would make our work relationships better. It would make our sales better. How many people think you become more effective if you learn how to master the art of asking good questions? So today, what I'd like to do is just take my time to give you some reasons why you need to master the art of asking good questions. Number one, I believe it is the primary tool for gathering more detailed and personal information about your client. One of the things that I want us to learn, and, and I, I was taught this a long time ago by a guy that was not much unlike this Jack Palance character, this curly guy. My first, one of my first outside sales jobs, I got in the car with a guy. I'm going to need a bottle of water up here, just uh, a little something up here. It is hot under these lights. Thank you. Um, I, I got in the car with a guy and was learning how to sell advertising, business to business. And uh, the guy they put me in the car with, his name was Mike. And I got in this car with this, this dude named Mike, and Mike had a tweed jacket on with uh, leather patches on here when tweed jackets and leather patches weren't in. They were in and then they went out. Now they're back in again, okay? So like, but at that time, they were not in. And he had kind of like long gray hair, and he had like some kind of Grecian formula in it that it kind of slicked back. And he smoked in his car, and we drove an old Malibu with two doors, and the doors were so heavy and the car was so old that you kind of had to lift the door to shut it, or it wouldn't shut all the way. How many people are old enough in the room to know what that's like? You got to lift the door to get the door shut in the car, right? I am. And I got in the car with this guy, and I watched him go around and sell and, he, and, and, and this guy just, he, he told his story, he talked his story, and he, at the end, he's, he's talking to these business owners, and some of them he missed completely, and others he closed. And as I walked out of that sales training uh, for him with two days, I, I asked myself, what is, what is his secret? What is his secret? He didn't really have a process. He didn't really understand, um, he didn't really understand uh, the dynamics of the client, but what he did in the moment is he was able to ask a few good questions that allowed him to unlock one little idea and one little thing, and then he would sell to that one thing. And I was amazed because I thought, this guy is not that good. Well, how is he selling at this level? I thought, if I could just learn how to ask good questions and learn how to build a process for myself, it could change everything for me. And so it is the primary tool for gaining detailed and personal information about your client. And when you do that, they will open up to you. Secondly, it's a powerful way to enhance relationship and trust. When you ask questions about someone else, who's doing the talking? Who's doing the talking? Is it you or is it them? Guess what? People like to talk about themselves, don't they? The most interesting person in the room is the person who is asking the best questions. Every time when I get around somebody of, um, of personal stature, what I would call personal stature, someone who's confident in who they are, every time I get around them, one thing I notice is they ask really good questions and they listen really well. Marlon Faulkner is one of those people. Marlon asks great questions and then he listens very well. And then about an hour later, he will come back and tell you something that you spoke to him, and he'll bring it back, and he'll remind you of something, which tells me that he was listening. 
Guys, this is a very powerful way to enhance a relationship and build trust. When you're trying to establish trust with your client, if you're not asking good questions and then following up with questions to their answers, you're never going to get to uh, the, the, the true level of need. Number three, it leads to insights that were not discovered at surface level questions. Asking good questions allows you to go deeper. Someone once told me that telling is not selling. Telling is not selling. You can write that in the chat. Telling is not selling. If you're trying to memorize a pitch and deliver a pitch to close sales, you're already losing. You're already losing. You see, uh, when you are able to ask questions, listen to the answers, and then follow up with those answers with another question, it allows you to go deeper. It allows you to go deeper and uncover what's really going on in that client situation, in that family situation, what their true need is. It allows you to, to go deeper. It's the second level question. My good friend Chris Ball says it's called emotional excavation. You can write that in the chat. Emotional excavation. Our job as life insurance agents, our job as insurance agents, whatever pro product or service that we're selling, is to get to the internal need of the client. It's to understand what they're trying to accomplish. And in order to do that, sometimes we have to emotionally exca excavate what's going on up here, get rid of the riffraff, because some of those people, Jesse Park, they're actually watching Prices Right. Right? And we have to get them off of Prices Right and who's going to win the showcase showdown, and we have to bring them in. Right? We have to bring them in. Right? I watched, I watched Price is Right when Bob Barker was on there. And that was Drew Carey. Is it someone else now? Is it still Drew? I don't know. Right? Some of you are laughing. You're like, how does he know that? Because my parents used to be those people. They used to watch that. But we have to get their attention off that. And we have to go deeper and find out what it is that they were really thinking about when they filled out that request card. How many of you work some type of leads in your business? Raise your hand if you work some type of leads. Show me hands. Yeah. Leads, right? Leads. So if you're working some type of leads, those people filled out a request at some point and said, I want more information on X. And in order to find out what is truly going on in their life, you have to get below that surface, the surface level. What were you thinking about when you filled out this card, Mr. Mr. Offert? What were you thinking about? Well, I was just thinking I needed some insurance. Well, great. Well, let me see if we can get you that. How's your health? right? Bad, <laughs> right? We're never going to get to it because that's a surface level. We've got to go deeper and we've got to find out what's below that surface. Number four, I would say that um, the fourth reason why uh, you need to master the art of asking good questions is that they create the perception of competence and confidence with you. The person asking the question is actually controlling the conversation without speaking the most. The person asking the best questions is the person directing and controlling the conversation without speaking the most. I want, you to, I want you to take note of that. Telling is not selling. The person asking the best questions is the person who's controlling and dictating the conversation without speaking the most. If you're speaking the most, you're losing. If your client's speaking the most, you're winning. Because when the client is speaking, you're learning. And it allows you to go deeper with them. And it gives you a perception and it puts you in a position of competence and confidence. And confidence and competence in sales sells. A person will buy from somebody who demonstrates authority. There are two primary ways to establish trust with a client. Number one is by demonstrating empathy. We do that by asking good questions and following up with deeper questions. The second is by establishing authority. Authority is knowledge in your products and services and in your confidence and ability to help them. And when you ask good questions, it puts you in control of the conversation and they see you as the authority figure. So remember to ask good questions. Number five, I would say it's the best way to uncover the biggest and most important concerns of your client. The biggest and most important concerns of your client. If people fill out a card, how many of you work in the final expense space? Anybody work in final expenses, final expense sales? Raise your hand high. Come on, wave them at me if you sold final expense. Wave them at me if you, if you sell mortgage protection. You help people protect their mortgage, right? Wave at me if you do that. Great. Those people filled out a card for a reason. And the basic answer that you're going to get is they were looking for coverage. I was just looking. How many people, right? I was just looking, right? You walk into a retail store, you're going to buy something, the person comes up to help you, and they say, how can I help you or may I help you? And you say, no, I am just looking. I am just looking. We all say this. It's a lie. It's a smokescreen. It's not true because 10 minutes later, they're actually getting me the size of the jacket that I went in there to look for. And I told them that I didn't need any help a minute ago, but now I'm asking for a size, 
right? We all do this. How many of you have done that? Come on, be honest, right? We've all done this, and we have to get to this most important and biggest need, and I will tell you that there are three levels of needs every human being has, three levels, three levels of needs. You can write these down. As we go through, I want you to put them in the chat. Number one is their external need, the external need. Every one of us has an external need, Right? If we go to about 1 or 2 o'clock and nobody's eaten since breakfast, guess what starts happening to our bodies? Our body starts saying, I am hungry. I'm hungry and I have an external need. I'm feeling it and I start to hunt for food. Right? I have to hunt for food. Or if I've got bills to pay on the weekend and I don't have enough money in the bank, right? I need to figure out how I'm going to move things around to pay the bills on the weekend. I have a real need. If I need to go to the store or go to the airport to pick up a friend, I have to have a car to go get them and I need the car is empty and I got to put gas in it. That's an external need. It's obvious. But people don't generally buy based on external needs. How many people know that people buy what they want, not always what they need, right? People buy what they want, not what they need. How many of you have been in a final expense home? They've got a giant 72-inch screen TV. They've got a PlayStation and an Xbox. They've got an iPhone 12 or 13, whatever it is now, and they've got a hole in their roof and there's snow coming in the other end, and they haven't fixed it yet, and it's been like that for two weeks, right? It happens. It happens. And you talk to them about their final expense needs, and they say, I can't afford it. That's a lie. It's a lie. It's not true. It, it's because they've allocated and they prioritize the things that they want over the things that they need. You see, when we go to this second level of need, uh, other than the external, we now move to the second level of need called their internal need. Their internal need. And internal needs, everybody, is based on how things make people feel. How things make people feel. How does this void in my life make me feel that I'm not covering this? How's it going to make me feel if I pass away and they don't have enough coverage for, their fam for my family? How's it going to make me feel if I know that my daughter and my son are going to have to go to the funeral home and figure out how to pay a bill that I didn't take care, for, take care of? How does that make me feel? And you see, it is these emotions. How's it going to make me feel if I get impaired from a critical accident? Or I could become, or I'd be diagnosed with a life-threatening cancer, and I can no longer go to work, and I'm, I cannot now pay the mortgage on the house that we just bought to raise our family in, and now I'm fighting for my life, and my wife now has to take time off to help take care of me, and her income is reduced. How is it going to make me feel to know that I could have done something about it, and I didn't, and what position is that putting my family in, and how it makes me feel about that is what moves the needle for people to take action. And if we never go there with people and never ask them those questions, how it makes them feel, we never get to that internal need. Here's a great question. Here's a great question to ask when you're in that, in a, that series of questions. When someone gives you an answer about how that makes them feel, you can turn around and say to them, tell me why that's important to you. Tell me why that's important to you. Because that opens up so much. It touches them right in the heart, Josh Youngs. It touches them right in the heart. Why is that important to you? It puts them in the seat. It puts them in the spotlight where they're now realizing they have to do something because this is how it makes them feel. And then I would say, lastly, um, asking good questions is the primary tool uh, for gaining agreement. I got to go back. I told you there was three levels. There's external, there's internal, and the last one is philosophical. Am I a good person? Is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Do good people take care of their families? Yes, they do. This is the right and wrong. So external, internal, philosophical, and we got to get to that internal need. That's where people take action. And I would say the last one is that good questions are the primary tool for gaining agreement with your client. And there's a way to do this by using micro agreements. So Mr. Youngs, what you've told me is that your family is really important to you, and because your sister didn't have protection in place, they're now having to try to raise money for her funeral, and you don't ever want your family to be in that position. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'm restating something that they've told me in the form of a question. That's called a microagreement. It's a tie-down. You're asking a question in the form of a microagreement or a tie-down. A tie-down can, uh, can be accomplished by making a positive statement 
followed by an affirmative response question. It, making a positive statement that requires an affirmative response question that allows you to get to that internal need. When you uh, gain these micro agreements throughout the sales process, it allows you to connect with the client on an internal level. Guys, I would say that most people in sales, if they could learn how to eliminate objections, objections in their life, objections in uh, the client's lives that they're gonna give to them, some of them are smoke screens, some of them are stalls, would we all do better in sales? Would we all think sales was a great career if we could learn to eliminate all the objections that people give us, yes? Yes, we would. There was a, a client of mine that uh, I sat with. I was doing training with a young man, and it was in the evening, and we went into this home, and uh, I knocked on the door, and we had a lead card. We had a tentative appointment set up. He said, stop by any time on Tuesday evening. I took this young man with me, knocked on the door, and the gentleman was sitting on the couch. But he had his back to us. He said, come on in. And so he didn't even turn to look to see who it was. We went on in and sat down. And the entire first 10 or 15 minutes, he was, he was stoic. He would not open up. He was like a can that wouldn't open up. And I was like the can opener. And I was trying to pry him open, you know, just with, with questions. And guys, sometimes you have to address the elephant in the room. Sometimes you have to address the tough things and be willing to go there with people. And he would not open up. He just says, I just want to know how much this costs. And he was closed and almost like he, he didn't want us there. He was, so, he was so frustrated. He just seemed frustrated. And I paused. I put down my materials. I sat down. And I, I, I kind of took a different stance. And I leaned over to him. And I said, uh, I said um, William, um, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, you seem really tense. I said, you seem frustrated. And I don't want you to be frustrated with me. We're just here to help. I said, but if it's something that I've done or something that I've said that has frustrated you, please, I want to know that. Because I would feel terrible to leave your house tonight knowing that I didn't serve you because of something that I did that frustrated you. I said, I know you said this was important to you a few minutes ago, but it's almost as if you don't want me to proceed. And I don't want to proceed if you don't want me to. I said, but I know what you said about your family. I know this is important. Can you tell me what's really on your mind, William? And in that moment, he bristled, sat up in his chair, <sighs> took a deep breath, and he said, my dad passed away two years ago. He didn't have any insurance. He said, my sister, who's well off, called us and made sure she took care of the arrangements. And my mom, who's in poor health, it's just me and her and my sister. And then they called, and my sister called and said that they needed $1,500 each from my mom, $1,500 from me, and $1,500 from her to take care of the funeral. He said, it was all the money I had. I put it together. It was all the money my mom had. He said, we went to that funeral that day, and he said, we got home later that afternoon, and my, my, my dad's body was not even cold in the ground. He said, my sister called me back and said she needed the other $1,500 from each of us to pay the balance of the funeral. We didn't know there was going to be a balance. There was no more money. We had no more money. And my sisters laughed at us to think that we didn't know that a funeral was going to cost almost $10,000. And he said, that caused a rift in my family. I haven't spoken to my sister in two years. He said, we paid her. She could have handled it. We paid her. He said, my mom, it was just so bad. He said, I never want my two kids to ever have to go through that, ever. And he stopped talking, and I said, William, if we can solve that right here tonight so you never have to worry about that again, would that be okay if I help you do that? And he said, yes, sir, let's do that. Guys, it sometimes takes you going deeper with that question and asking what you have to do to get to that internal need. Once people reveal that, you are now no longer selling anything. You are now helping them get the thing that they want the most. And it's always tied to something that's emotional, that's on their heart, and you have to get to that. Now, I can't cover any more in my time. In fact, my time is up. But we wanted to offer you a special gift. I like to give away things. Marlon says, he mentioned yesterday that I like to give away gifts. And so we have a gift for all of you. Everybody that's watching, I have a gift for you. We are actually developing a new course at the Life Insurance Academy called Mastering the Art of Yes. Mastering the Art of Yes. We have courses in the library. We do weekly coaching. But this course, we need help in developing the content. 
So we are inviting you to join us on a 90-minute workshop on Monday night, this coming Monday, for absolutely free, and we're going to be breaking down mastering the art of yes. We're going to be covering the three keys to reducing resistance from your prospect, the four objections and the framework to overcome each one, how to become rejection-proof, and the power of this, the power of the next step. It's starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Central, and all you have to do is text YES to this number, 845-420-3337. If someone can put that in the chat, 845, there it is, 845-420-3337. Put the word YES, text the word YES to that number, and that will allow you to get registered for that webinar, and we'll take you through 90 minutes of in-depth training on mastering the art of YES so that we can help you level up your business, become rejection-proof, see more people, uh, write more business, and make more money. Thank you so much for your time. Roger Short. Hey, I want to leave what up here really quick. Okay? Let's give him an unbelievable round of applause. Roger Short. Thank you. Roger Short. I love it. We can see the virtual applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you a question, buddy, because you've gotten really involved. You've been in, in everything we're doing. You didn't come to the first 8%, even though I invited him. Yes, you personally, yeah, picked up the phone and dialed me. But he showed up to the second one, and he showed up ever since. Yes. What was your experience like? Why did you keep showing up? Why are you bringing more people a part of it now? At first, I was skeptical. Who's ever skeptical about anything new in life, especially when a guy throws a dance party on a virtual screen? Come on now. Screaming his head off. You wonder, something's up with that guy. And so that's what I saw on YouTube. I didn't know what he was trying to accomplish. And uh, we decided the following year to go out and check this out for ourselves. We brought my executive team and I. We went and sat in there. And I got up, guys. And I will tell you, everyone watching right now, I will tell you, we got up from that event and we left after two days. And I said, every person that I know, every agent that's a part of our organization, every agent that, cons uh, that uh, consults with us for training through the Life Insurance Academy, they would have been better served. You would have been better served had they been in that place. They would have been uh, more trained. They would have got more knowledge. They would have been more hopeful. They would have seen prospects of the future that they didn't see before. And they would have got one great idea to move their life forward. And it was from that moment, Cody, that we decided we were in on this with you. I've appreciated your passion. I've appreciated your drive to make this happen. We're doing the road shows together. Cincinnati's That's right. next. That's right. Cincinnati's next, next month. But uh, you need to get there. It'll change your life. Thank you, brother. Give it up for Roger Short. Thank you.